also on the YouTube channel. So I would like to welcome you all to this webinar organized by the UP Global Working Group on Salutogenesis. And this is already the second webinar of the series of webinars that is organized by UP to celebrate their 70th anniversary. My name is Laura Baumann and I'm a member of the Global Working Group on Salutogenesis. And I'm an assistant professor at the chair group Health and Society of Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And already for quite some years, I'm pretty much fascinated by the salutogenic way of thinking. And I'm very happy that I can participate in this webinar. And the upcoming hour, my fellow members of the working group will share their perspectives on how principles of salutogenesis can be used to design action strategies in health promotion. First, we have Professor Paolo Contu. He will, he will share a beautiful salutogenic story to get you familiar with this way of thinking as well as the action. And then Professor George ba Georg Bauer will introduce you to salutogenic theory and the aims and activities of our global working group. And then Dr. Adi Mana will share her insight on using salutogenesis to explore how people struggling with COVID-19 and remain mentally healthy. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Ruka Maas will present her research findings on applying salutogenesis to politics as well as policy making. And I would like to invite you all to write questions in the chat. And please, if you write a question, uh, include the name of the speaker to whom you want to address this question. And after the presentations, there will be time for questions and answers. Uh, just a few technicalities. Uh, please mute your microphone, but I can see that's already been done. And when you hear a little bell ringing, this is me just uh, addressing that time is almost over for one of the speakers. Well, now I will give the floor to Professor Paolo Conto. Paolo is UP's Vice President for Europe and Professor of Public Health at the University of Cagliari, Italy. Paolo, the screen is yours. Um, now it's really my screen. That's good. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, my task today is to start this uh, presentation about salutogenesis with a salutogenic story taking into account particularly social cohesion as one of the main triggers of salutogenesis and using a blue ribbon as an example of a salutogenic trigger in a special village of Sardinia, my region. But we can start talking a bit in general about community cohesion. It's clear that community cohesion is a powerful trigger to go in the direction of salutogenesis and that's because community cohesion enables citizens, professional policy makers, to hang together, to define shared, shared visions, and especially to make the community a meaningful, meaningful place to live. And we will see that the meaningful place and meaningfulness is a central concept of salutogenesis. But what happened in reality? You can see here two women. Two women and, uh, these women are not looking at each other. This is a very frequent situation. Often the sense of belonging of community ownership is very low. Citizens ignore each other. Sometimes they are fighting against each other. So an essential preliminary step in community action is to foster the sense of community belonging in order to be able to create common vision. And now we can go to this village and to the story of uh, more than 40 years ago. In uh, 40 years ago, the city council of this small village, is, I think 2,000 inhabitants in the mountains of Sardinia, my region in Italy, had the idea to build a war memorial. It's something that happening very often, I think, in several countries. And they call a local famous art artist to work on this. But she refused this idea and she proposed a completely different alternative. And the idea was to do something that was fully rooted in the village culture, was not relying, relying on one author, but was a collective work, and was something not needing funding. 
people were not so happy about uh, most of the people was not so happy about this idea. But some person were intrigued by the proposal and they start a process of advocacy with community. You can see uh, the first image with a, a person talking, and this is the local artist with other person in the village and talking with people, listening with people, so a clear salutogenic and her promoting action. Several problems uh, emerge, but also some uh, tradition and some stories from the community emerge. It was clear that people felt alone in the, in the village. They were fighting each other, they were suspicious of each other, but also they have something in common, and particularly a local legend. A girl was sent to the mountain to bring bread to the shepherds, this is an, an area of shepherds. And uh, she was caught in a storm and found shelter in a cave. It's in some way to find a place, a safe place. But immediately after, a sky blue ribbon appeared in the sky, and the girl decided to follow, to, ch to try to chase the ribbon. And so went out from the cave, and in a few minutes, the cave collapsed in a landslide. So the girl was saved going out from her situation in the cave and trying to find something better, something different like the blue ribbon. And the proposal was uh, to use this uh, metaphor, this legend. Let's uh, to transform the legend in a metaphor and transform the legend in, a, in an action, in an art performance uh, involving the, inter the entire village. Uh, we can tie our houses to each other, and at the same time, or immediately later, we can tie our houses to the mountain. It's like holding hands with each other, but also holding hands with the nature. In some way, it was uh, already an idea of what now we are calling one health, and was rooted in the village culture, a, a metaphor, not relying on one auto and not needing funding. There were several discussions, the idea was not immediately accepted, and particularly people has a problem. How can we, uh, connect our houses with people we don't like, with people with whom we have problems. And for example, for this, uh, they found a solution to have a different kind of styling with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, idea, with different, uh, we are knotting where there was friendship and not, not nothing, but just uh, having the ribbon where it was some kind of uh, uh, difficulty of conflict. There were other similar situations, but after this long and participative process, the proposal were endorsed by the whole community. And exactly, I realized preparing this uh, presentation, exactly 40 years ago, 1981, all the citizens participate, they use 26 kilometers of ribbon and they tied all houses. And at the end, they tied also the houses to the mountain. At the end of the day, uh, without any plan, everybody decided to meet in the main square, to join the main square, and they were talking and dancing well. What is the meaning of this? This is a, pro a process that can facilitate comprehensibility, one aspect of salutogenesis. Enable citizens to understand the village, to identify the village as a community, a community identifying the challenges, resources, and opportunities. They understand and they feel a sense of manageability. They were able to overcome difficulties, to mobilize and new resources and opportunities, going to a common goal, but that the other way. And especially, they have increased their sense of meaningfulness. So the ability to perceive the community as a place with a common vision. Just going very quick, it was, uh, it was not something stopping there, but now in this village, they have several uh, new things, uh, foundation uh, for art, ancient workshops, uh, new cooperative for textile uh, activities. They participate in a park also 
going sustainable energy. They are open for tourism and using local food. And they are giving uh, thanks to the person who started. We are going to understand more and more the message of 24 years ago. You wanted to give a lecture about civic education, peace, dialogue, research. I, we think that this could be a good way to understand how we can use social cohesion to start with a salutogenic process toward a salutogenic setting. Thank. And now I give the floor to the next uh, speaker. I have also, I think, to interrupt here. And the next spe speaker is Georg Bauer. He's professor and head of a division of uh, public health at the University of Zurich. And especially important for uh, here to, today, he's also the leader of a global working group of salutogenesis. Please go. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Also welcome from my side. And I have now both the pleasure and the challenge to give an overview of salutogenesis in within five minutes, uh, which I try to do now. Um, certainly, first need to acknowledge the original author of, um, um, of salutogenesis, which is certainly Aaron Antonovsky, and he had been developing this concept during the 1970s and 18s uh, in two seminal books uh, listed here. And what is his most key uh, contribution really to our field of health promotion? Well, he said, instead of always focusing only on the origin of disease as in pathogenesis, he suggested a new uh, question, uh, which is really asking about the origin of health instead of disease. And also, I think he really made this very big contribution to really find a, a perfect term to make clear that this is a completely mirror image of pathogenesis and really complementary uh, to pathogenesis by coining this term of salutogenesis. So with one word, we have a clear focus on the origin of health. And what does now this uh, new term and question contribute? Well, he suggested that instead of focusing on risk factors, as we do in pathogenesis, we would rather need to focus on a balance between life stresses, which we continuously encounter in our life, and the very important general resistance resources in our life, which helps us to deal uh, with these challenges. And by doing so, we can also move away from just focusing on a single disease outcomes, but to look more broadly how this good balance of life stresses and resources help us to move more uh, towards the health end of a so-called health is disease continuum. Next slide. So secondly, besides offering a key question, he also even offered a key answer to his questions of origin um, of health. Um, based on his very comprehensive, uh, both qualitative and quantitative uh, research, he came up with this concept of the so-called sense of uh, coherence, which is defined as a global orientation to life uh, human beings have. Um, the sense of coherence can be uh, explained or specified by three facets. On the one hand, it's really about the cognitive component, how comprehensible I perceive my life, I, I can find some order uh, in what's going around uh, me, uh, going on around me, uh, which makes it more comprehensible. Then the manageability, do I have enough resources available to deal with challenges I face in my life? And last not least, the meaningfulness, uh, can I manage to find some deeper meaning what is going on around me and with me in my life? And besides uh, finding this uh, key answer, he also offered this uh, according or complementary measurements, the so-called orientation to life questionnaire. And this had been used really in hundreds of study and uh, evidence really sh clearly shows also longitudinally that people with a more stronger sense of coherence also do better with their health. So they rather move, um, move to the east end of the health ease disease continuum. So why is it important uh, to health promotion? I would like to use this simplified uh, model of salutogenesis to make that point. We can, uh, on the one hand, start with the individual and his or her sense of coherence. Uh, when this sense of coherence is strong, 
Then this um, a model postulates that this person is more able to perceive stressors as something uh, which can be overcome and dealt with. And they do so because at the same time, they have both uh, the ability to uh, identify important resources which help them to deal with the stressors and also to use these resources well to overcome uh, the stressors. And when you ask what this kind of general assistance resources are, that's really a very broad range of things, as you see at the bottom, as postulated by Antonovsky, reaches from the individual uh, through community all the way to society, as you will see uh, in later talks. And also it can range anywhere from the physical, biochemical, to the cognitive, emotional, all the way up to the cultural. So really the positive sides of life, which helps us to deal um, and overcome stresses are key here in this model. And now if I have the situation that I have the stresses, but I have at the same time with general assistance resources to overcome them, this will lead to a life experience here in the second box from the left, where I perceive my life as consistent, I have this good load balance between stresses and resources, and I feel uh, part, to be an active part really in an agency for my life to deal with this, um, different challenges. And given this life experience uh, will further increase and enhance my sense of coherence and finally lead to a positive movement towards the east end of this health east disease continuum. So with that, I think we can nicely tell this uh, dual story for health promotion. We could either focus on the sense of coherence of individuals or also groups and try to immediately approach the sense of coherence or, or better, and we also should focus on the left-hand side, provide situations which are resource rich and bring people together. So I think uh, Paolo's example was really nice uh, taken, that this was um, a way where you bring two uh, people together, you let them participate, and by that you strengthen both individual and collective sense of coherence, but you also enhance the resources in this uh, particular community. And we can see in later examples that this also can be applied on the society level, like in Adi's uh, presentation, and even the policy level, like in Ruka's presentation. With that, I uh, need to stop with this overview and just uh, I would like to finish to just mention our global working group of cytogenesis that had been founded by Bengt uh, Winström, who is also present today, um, actually already in 2007. And he really aim uh, to offer cytogenesis as the theory base for health promotion uh, to IOHPE and its uh, constituencies. That's our um, major goal. And also for having an even bigger impact beyond health promotion, we also started with Society for Free Oral Research on Solitogenesis, which is even promoting and offering this concept beyond uh, health uh, sector um, in a more narrow sense. What we do are things like a handbook of cytotogenesis. The second edition will be coming out already next month. Um, we organize conferences, which will be mentioned later. And we even conduct uh, international research, which now will be presented by Adi. Uh, with that, I'm actually at the end of my own presentation and would now like uh, to welcome and introduce Adi, who is uh, at the School of Behavioral Sciences in the Paris Academic Center in Israel. She's currently coordinating a large-scale study internationally on salutogenesis in times of corona crisis, and we're uh, very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gil. I will share the screen with you. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm very, very happy and proud to be with you in this webinar and to talk about salutogenesis in time of COVID-19 pandemic. In my short talk, I would like to share with you the preliminary results of an international study that explored the role of sense of coherence and other coping resources in promoting mental health during the pandemic. I will try to answer the question, how do people struggle with the COVID-19 pandemic and remain mentally healthy? As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a chaos and changed the predictable reality and our regular way of life. Actually, a year after, we still do not know when and where the virus will attack and what damage it will cause in the short and long term, since the, the, the pandemic is unfortunately is uh, ongoing. 
while you looking at this picture and remembering your own experience uh, of this dramatic year of COVID-19 pandemic, what do you remember? How did you adjust to the continuing changes in the no longer well-known reality of your everyday life? I'm so sorry that we do not have enough time for sharing our experience with each other. It could be so interesting. However, I believe that in the process of adjustment to this new reality, all of you probably had some good and some bad experiences. Based on the salutogenic approach, I will assume that the reason for some of the better experiences that you probably have had would fall into the following three categories, manageability, comprehensibility, and meaningfulness, and those three categories combine the concept of sense of coherence. Manageability, as Paolo and Georg uh, explained before, is related to the degree to which we might feel that we have the ability to cope with challenges, to solve a uh, problem, the belief that we can manage those problems. We have individual, social, national resources that are needed to manage this pandemic crisis. Comprehensibility, refer to the extent to which we perceive what is happening around us and also what is happening inside us in our inner world as rational. The ability to understand, to find order, to see things as coherent, clear and structured can help us cope. This ability is not measured by the kind of knowledge you have. For example, it can be a conspiracy theory about the pandemic or scientific theory, but the way this knowledge helps you to understand or to believe to understand what is going on around you. And meaningfulness refer to the feeling that our life and our experience has some meaning, that this global crisis can teach us something, that this unique period has some purpose, for example, to give us a chance to improve, to better understand, and to do something different. As Georg mentioned before, Antonovsky suggested that sense of coherence is a core cons uh, coping resources that help the individual to identify and mobilize relevant resources to cope with stress. According to this hypothesis, we can expect that during the pandemic, adults with a strong sense of coherence can find the proper coping resources in their surrounding and by that to promote their mental health. In the uh, recent, uh, recent uh, international study, we tested this uh, hypothesis and explored the relationship between sense of coherence and other social and national coping resources and mental health. Mental health was defined according to the World Health Organization as the presence of positive feeling, positive fun functioning, and refer to how people evalu evaluate their life but we also explore a pathogenic outcome, the level of general anxiety. The coping resources included sense of coherence, uh, the perception of social support one received from his environment, family, close community and friend, the level of trust in the government and in the institution that are in charge of managing the pandemic, and sense of national coherence, that is related to the perception of the national group as manageable, comprehensible, and giving us meaning. We also explore several risk factors and other social demographic variables. Sorry, here is the sample. The sample conducted by members of the Salutogenic Global Working Group in the IOHPE. The data were collected mainly during the outbreak of the pandemic. In addition, a longitudinal study was conducted in Israel starting at the outbreak of the pandemic and included five phases of the crisis, the most recent uh, conducted in the middle of the mass vaccination project. Since I have very, very limited time, I will only share with you the main result. You are invited to receive the full manuscript by writing to my email. And the first question is, what promotes mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, we uh, conducted several hierarchical regression uh, to test the role of coping resources, risk, risk factor, and demographic variable in predicted mental health and anxiety. And among all samples, sense of coherence was the main predictor of mental health and anxiety. This finding confirmed the central role Antonovsky assigned to sense of coherence as a universal core and major coping resource 
not limited by cultural and situational characteristics. According to the assumption that strong sense of coherence allow one to reach out for appropriate resources, we suggested a mediating model in which perceived social support mediated the relationship between sense of coherence and mental health. And this model was confirmed in all the different samples. And what about the uh, longitudinal uh, effects of COVID-19? Uh, when we look at the longitudinal study conducted in Israel with the five phases, we found that while the level of mental health and coping resources of perceived social support, trust, and sense of national coherence significantly and uh, gradually decreased from the first phase to the next four phases of the data collection, the level of sense of coherence remains stable along the five recent stages. Uh, in addition, uh, people who reported on a higher level of sense of coherence during the outbreak of the pandemic also have higher level of mental health at the end of this year of the pandemic. So what can we learn, sorry, <laughs> what can we learn um, from this uh, study? COVID-19 provides us a unique opportunity to understand how people from different countries struggle with the same stressor, a difficult pandemic. It seems that sense of coherence is a universal protective factor that contributed uh, to effective coping with stressor, even in time of widespread health crisis. Thus, exploring sense of coherence via ongoing international public health survey could be an important step to predict mental health of different population. Moreover, it seems that during global pandemic, it is not enough to provide material resources, but perhaps, and even more important, there is a need to enhance the ability of members of the society to comprehend, manage, and give meaning to their chaotic reality. But how to do it? Our next speaker, Rusha Mas, a salutogenic researcher with a, a focus on so, uh, social policy and society development, will explain how we can apply salutogenesis to politics and policy making. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please write it down in the Q&A box or send them to my email. Yes, thank you, Adi. Well, uh, I'm a little bit concerned you promised too much. I'm not sure I have all the answers, but maybe I can try to lift our gaze and um, raise some of the questions <laughs> which um, come from hearing all of you present a very, very interesting research. Um, I want to focus on salutogenic societies and social policy. Um, and I'm going to take you on a journey to explore if we can outline how salutogenesis might inform these fields beyond matters of health and what are the, the benefits or what might the benefits of this be. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I start by briefly defining some central concepts like politics, um, which is understood as the process of making and executing collective ideas which implies to negotiate competing interests, values, distribution of resources, and so on. Social policy is how we follow up on these political decisions and implement them into our societies. So in a way, we can say that politics is the what of society development, while social policy describes the how this development is carried out. Last, well, what is a salutogenic society? Um, again, I don't have the answer yet, but we can make some assumptions. First is salutogenesis is about the origins of health. So a salutogenic society should facilitate for good health among its members. And after what we heard uh, Georg and Adi talk about, this of course might imply to facilitate for the development of a strong sense of coherence in individuals and also in communities. Um, yeah. And this so sense of coherence is an important coping resource when it comes to promoting your own health and also, and maybe especially when it comes to coping with challenges. 
So in light of the recent events, which Ari talked about, um, we might wonder if a salutogenic society also should be a society that is able to cope even with unexpected and, and quite overwhelming stresses in a salutary way, which means not only by coping, but maybe learning and growing with the crisis. Because um, as Adi just said, what, what um, um, the SOC did protect people from negative consequences during the pandemic, but experiences we made during the pandemic and how, how it was met from our societies, again, had an effect on our sense of coherence and on our perception of the resources around us. So how we as a society deal with overwhelming stresses has major consequences for health and well-being of our members. And it might also play a very important role in how we as a society develop after or during the stressor. Because if there's one thing we might be sure of, is it two minutes, Laura? Just started two minutes ago. <laughs> you are doing fine, Ruka. Okay. It's not even up to two. Everyone so, keeps very well to the time. <laughs> I just heard a blink. Yes, because what we can be sure of, it's not so much we can be sure of, but there will be more global stressors coming our way. And as a society, we will we'll have to meet them in any way. So in one way, we might look at the COVID-19 pandemic as a significant event for the global community. It turned our world upside down. It challenges our coping strategies. It changes our resources and it forces us to think in new ways. As a significant event, it also represents a chance to strengthen SOC and to learn how to deal with stress and maybe even contribute to positive development in other places like digitalization or new vaccine technologies and so on. But then what happens if the policies that define our societies are perceived as incoherent rather than coherent? Let's look at uh, another significant event during the last year, the Black Lives Matters movement. This movement started in a specific societal context, the US of A, which sees itself as the land of the free, where everyone is equal and citizens' rights are protected by the state and law and the police force. The police is an important societal resource who will help and protect you when your rights are threatened. That's the story. But then what happens if some members of this society feel that um, this does not reflect the lived reality? If instead of being a resource, the police is regarded as a threat. If parents want their children to not seek out the police when in trouble, and to not defend your rights when you meet them, because what you have to do is to avoid everything that might cause trouble because they're afraid what might happen. Of course, this addresses matters of comprehensibility as the narrative about the police being your friend and helper turns out to be only part of the picture. And it also addresses matters of manageability. If this important societal resource for you, it's not only not a resource, but it might even be a stressor. Coping is harder. And if the lack of this specific resource even makes it harder to mobilize other resources, like defending your legal rights, this has, again, patience for what meaningful perspectives I can see for me and my peers in this society, which provides us with resources that turn out to be stresses. Well, luckily here, there were some people that were able to derive meaningful perspectives, gained new understandings and mobilized the other resources like the community and like social media. And they created a movement that addressed these incoherencies. And the fact that Derek Chauvin was convicted yesterday might be taken as a sign of real institutional and societal change towards more coherence, hopefully. So in many ways, the Black Lives Matters movement is a successful attempt of making sense of an incoherent situation and thereby also increase societal coherence. Because making sense of chaotic situations is at the heart of the salutogenic process. 
If you recall, one of the major paradigm shifts in salutogenesis was to not look at the healthy state as the default, but the healthy state is a state of entropy and chaos, and it's the individual's task to make sense of this chaos. So making sense of the world around us is a core human task, and it's a task that never really ends, because as history unfolds, conditions change, and we also have to. However, experience and incoherence creates a tension, and this tension needs to be resolved. So individuals that experience our society as incoherent will set out to create coherence for better or for worse. So maybe the race of conspiracy theories during the COVID pandemic might be understood as the quest for coherence in the face of an overwhelming stressor, which challenges our perceptions of coherence. There are very few of us who really grasp the science behind it and uh, understand the consequences um, and even fewer that have the resources to avoid the stress or even contribute to, to battle it in any way. Well, the tragic of conspiracy theories in this regard is that quite often they point towards real incoherence in our systems, like media narratives focusing on health and protecting the health of people, and then political decisions that favor economic matters. However, Instead of strengthening coherence, um, these theories try to reestablish coherence by limiting the context from which coherent experiences are derived. For example, dismissing media or even science as well as sources of information and only relying on news from various online networks. This can result in a picture that gives individuals a sense of comprehensibility and purpose, but that's fundamentally different from what everyone else believes, and that also often fails to predict future outcomes, because it's not really coherent. And very interestingly, this resembles something Antonovsky describes as a rigid sock, which is a very strong perception of coherence, that which built on very few and inflexible coping strategies and which, according to him, are doomed to shatter when meeting real-life conditions. Well, all in all, it's very easy to make fun of people holding very different understandings of reality. However, such diverging perceptions might have real-life consequences for all of us if they trigger people to raise their resources and to act to establish coherence in line with their beliefs, which we have seen in many extremist movements during the last decades, um, a recent example was uh, the storming of the Capitol in January based on, um, because this uh, people could not make sense of the electoral outcome other than it must have been rigged because they had built a coherence around the loser of this election. Okay, <clears throat> so after this journey into global dynamics and high up there stuff, um, I try to drag us a little down to earth and return to a safer ground. Why is this important for us as health scientists, health practitioners, and health promoters? Well, policy coherence is a term which has gained increasingly um, attention and it has been identified as a main driver for health equity and well being. So it kind of emerges as a valid goal in itself. And it's even highlighted by this whole of society and whole of government approaches um, that are very um, in focus, because these involve a very wide range of actors and sectors. So just to illustrate how complex these processes are, I talk about um, very briefly, a very uh, known example from health promotion, how to get kids to walk to school. Look like, looks like an easy task, but if you start thinking about it, there's a myriad of approaches and actors involved from politicians, decision makers, city planners, school staff, city maintenance, parents, children, maybe even the employers of the parents and you name it. So if you want to get and if you want to get kids to walk to school, you need to address matters of comprehensibility, like knowing the benefits of walking, but also knowledge about safe routes and how to find school manageability. Are there any safe routes? How long is it to school? How much time do I have? And of course, meaningfulness, like, is it cool to walk to school? Who else is walking? Who can I walk with? 
all of this is kind of linked to the outcome of the action. How, how does this action appear to the kids? But of course, you could also address these matters of comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness among collaborators. Like, does everyone in here understand their role in making kids walk to school? Does city maintenance know how important it is to maintain these routes? Does everyone get the resources to follow up on responsibilities and maybe especially new responsibilities you didn't have before? Did you get more resources? And do I have the motivation to do this job? Does it contribute to my job or is it something on the side? Do I get any reward or social accept thanks for my input here? So not as an answer, but maybe coherence as um, comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness might be a valid approach to assess and maybe even create both vertical and horizontal coherence in these settings. This, of course, needs to be explored and critically examined. Um, but I want to suggest that a salutogenic society um, Sorry, no, I just got a little lost. It's a society that also holds coherent perspectives and where we can use the framework of coherence to assess both outcomes and processes. But of course, there are a lot of open questions. Like, can we really create coherent outcomes and processes by using these three dimensions of comprehensibility, manageable or meaningfulness, or is there more to it? And how might these again be translated into social policies that addresses the challenges of diverging understanding, lack of resources, or meaningful perspectives and motivation for change? Yes, so to wrap it up, I think a coherent society should also be a society that holds coherent perspectives for all its members. And coherent perspectives are then maybe characterized by these three dimensions of comprehensibility and manageability and meaningfulness. So now the next task is to find out how can we create such a society. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to the Q&A section and Paola. Yes, yes, thank you. I... I have two points in the question. One, uh, very shortly. One was related to the dimension of uh, my proposal. I was talking about a village of 2,000 inhabitants, but very often we are working with uh, places of hundreds of thousands of people. So it's clear that this is more complicated. I don't have uh, a uh, very definitely or very strong answer, but in my experience, what I can tell that uh, when we, I like very much the idea of a trigger. So I think that also in the cities you can use or you can have a neighborhood, a group of schools, uh, uh, some kind of also virtual setting as a trigger. We work, for example, in a neighborhood in Cagliari, that is in a city with uh, 200,000 inhabitants, working for years with a school and with other stakeholders. And in some way, the process was not so different than in Olasse, not so successful, because probably this is the difficulty with the city. But anyway, I see, I, we have seen some change in comprehensibility, meaningfulness, and in the general, I, and manageability. So I think it's possible with small settings. Another point, I was inspired for another question. Uh, I will not give a direct answer to the question, but uh, I think was open, the question from uh, Nicole, and uh, the idea of language. What I can tell, thinking to my story of Ulasse, that very often we are very worried about uh, words we are using, about uh, talking about the salutogenesis health promotion actions. But for example, in this village, nobody was thinking to help, nobody was knowing <laughs> Her promotion of salutogenesis or Antonovsky or other things. In some way, communities, probably something also natural in the community. 
the idea of uh, looking for meaningfulness, uh, comprehensibility, and, uh, and you know, I don't have a third word, but anyway. So I think that very often we have uh, to just to move things, and then probably we will discover together the white words. Thank you. And now I give it to Gerard for continuing. Yeah. Yes, thank you. No. Thank you for answering, Paolo. And indeed, uh, I think uh, Georg also has something uh, to say about that, right? The use of terms in health promotion. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for this question. The question is, is it, is it not way too complex with terms out of the genesis because people do not really understand well? Uh, I must say, even if I present that to my medical colleagues, they never really can uh, understand it initially. But I must say within experts which are really trained heavily in the pathogenic paradigm, it's really an eye opener that there's something different in addition to what they normally hear in their education. So I find it a very powerful term when you speak uh, to medical or healthcare professionals. I think there it fits very well. But I fully agree as soon as we turn to real life and, and communities and so on, then we need to uh, really translate it and connect well uh, to the language and understanding of people. Um, and let's just use an example, which you all know, I mean, in uh, health promoting settings, we always talk about health promoting schools, uh, health promoting universities and so on. That's really about salutogenic schools and so on, but you would never use this term because people in these settings would not easily uh, understand that terminology, I, I fully agree. Um, also, I mean, the question always is, I think we heard now a lot about this coherence, which I think is really a very core concept. Uh, but still, it's really, from my point of view, still only uh, a kind of personal or collective resource. Uh, but what do we want to achieve? So also somehow we need to talk uh, so about salutogenic outcome. And fair certain, we also like to use terms such as flourishing, um, uh, thriving, and so on, which would be attractive outcomes, also more easily understandable to people. We were just talking about the vision of our Swiss School of Public Health. And there I could introduce that it's not only about promoting health, but also assuring the people reach a full human potential. So I think we always need to find the right wording um, depending on the setting where we operate with salutogenesis. Yes, I think that that feeds very nicely into a question from Klaus Lindberg to Adi. Adi, yes. can you... Uh... Um... Okay, so thank you very much, much uh, Klaus Lindberg, for your question. A uh, question about the differences between uh, the concept of sense of coherence and sense of national coherence. Um, sense of coherence, as, as you all heard, uh, is a global perception of the world as com uh, comprehensible, manageable, and meaningful. Uh, uh, but as uh, uh, Paolo and uh, uh, Rusha just uh, uh, give just give us very good example of a sense of coherence that could be related to specific group and community, and sense of national coherence defined as enduring tendency to perceive one national uh, uh, group as comprehensible, meaningful, and manageable. Uh, comprehensible, uh, uh, it's related to the perception that life in the national group is predictable, known and understood. Uh, manageable, it's the, the perception that the national group can assist its member, is available to them, uh, um, meet, the, meet their uh, demands and needs. And uh, meaningfulness uh, uh, relates to the perception that belonging to the uh, national group gives meanings to its members. Um, but a sense of national uh, coherence is a very interesting concept because in, in one hand, it, it is a coping resource that promotes health. But on the other hand, we found in several uh, studies conducted in a conflict zone by Professor Schiffer Sagi and our group, that sense of national coherence is also related to rejection, the outlook member, um, and their collective narratives, and therefore it could serve as a potential obstacle for uh, peace. In the context of the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we found that uh, in several countries like USA, Israel, and Brazil, 
a, a sense of national coherence with significant uh, coping resources, uh, coping resource for right-wing voter and not for left-wing voter. Uh, and also the left-wing voter in those countries had, had lower level of mental health. And, and moreover, a sense of national coherence was a stronger predictor uh, of mental health and anxiety compared to trust in governmental authorities. Uh, so it seems that uh, um, countries that suffered from political crisis during the pandemic, uh, something deeper than trust was shaken among people who are living in the opposition. Uh, and, and this maybe could, it could be the sense of national forgiveness. Uh, I hope uh, I answer your question. And uh, Rusha, <laughs> this is your turn. Yes, I think uh, Ruka, this this leads perfectly up to 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 a question for you, and that is, although you don't want to be explicit as you told, because there's no research done that, but could you perhaps share your dream about such a society in which social policy is shaped in a way that it creates balance rather than just you know the polarization that Adi just managed that some people, you know create separate groups from others? Yes, thank you for this uh, tricky questions and uh, not to spoil anything, but I left the world of politics like 15 years ago because the more I knew, the less I was sure about my answers. So that's where I'm now, <laughs> still trying to find out. But, um, well, I try to answer, um, even if I won't give you like, like, um, a lot of thoughts about the outcomes, but uh, as my focus is mostly on implementation, actually, I've been thinking a lot about salutogenic processes in societies. And um, just to recall that these three dimensions of comprehensibility, manageability, and meaningfulness, they are linked to core experiences. Comprehensibility of yeah, making cognitively sense of the chaos, manageability of overcoming overcomable challenges and experiencing load balance. And meaningfulness is about influencing and take part in decisions. So an individual can have a sense of coherence um, based on all the resources and even independent from that conditions. And it has been... Um, it has been warned against linking values to this sense of coherence because a person with a strong sense of coherence is not necessarily the better person as Adi just talked about also. It might even make us kind of um, rejecting all the others. <clears throat> However, on a societal level, what we would often find is that social policy uh, incoherence um, emerges when addressing minority groups because the social policies are tuned in toward the majority views. So the incoherence often appears in, in the minority experiences. Um, so what I think is to have a real uh, salutogenic policy, we need to make sure that when we form policy and when we implement the measures, we need to kind of try to create coherence for everyone in society, no matter what their position. And if you read Antonovsky carefully, he actually uh, talks a lot about this, how our position in society affects our stock and our ability to cope in a way. So I think that is what we need to address and try to level out. And there we can use this dimension of comprehensibility, manageability and meaningfulness to kind of identify some strategies which might be very important in forming and implementing social policy. One is comprehensibility is about knowledge sharing, not only providing information top down, but also integrating the um, bottom up knowledge, especially of minority groups. When we want to address manageability, we need to address matters of social equity and distribution of resources. Uh, so approaches linked so this, I would say, are salutogenic. And then for the meaningfulness dimension, we need to apply inclusive decision-making and especially include those 
who experience the incoherences in our systems and can address them. So as a society, I think to really create coherent societies, uh, one thing we need to take into account is the diversity of experiences people make when moving through our societies and to really try to ground our approaches and our social policy in this diversity and in these three dimensions of social. I'm not sure if this was an answer, but that's as far as I dare to go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ruka, as well as everyone, all the other speakers, of course. We are already at the end of this webinar, but this certainly is not the last chance uh, to share uh, perspectives on genesis because very soon, uh, there will be organized the sixth international conference on genesis and it will also take place online at the 17th and the 18th of June. And this is right after the UP European Conference on Health Promotion. And this year's topic of the Salutogenic Conference is advancing salutogenesis towards thriving societies. And topics include advancing the salutogenic model of health, its concepts as well as applications. And applications concern both the health sector as beyond the health sector. And if you want to register for the conference, please go to the UP website. And then on June 4th, there will be another opportunity to join us in sharing perspectives. It is uh, another webinar of one hour, and it is specifically on suited to genesis and nutrition promotion. And we organize it together with the European Federation of the Dietetic Associations, it's AFOT. And information about registration will be published soon at the Global Working Group's website. And uh, we're now really at the end. And I would like to thank you all for being here and sharing your questions with us. Uh, the webinar, if you want to, you can look back because it's uh, all on YouTube. And um, again, thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you during the conference.